Okay then, hi everybody, um, let's get started. Um, my name is um, Matthew Wright from IIED um, and welcome to this event on how least developed countries are proactively working at national level to put the goals of the Paris Agreement into practice, focusing on their experiences of the implications of the new transparency framework for LDC practitioners. Um, but now I'd like, like to hand over to um, today's moderator, uh, which is Fernanda Alco. Thank you, Matt, and thank you all of you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Fernanda Alcobe. I'm a researcher in the Climate Change Group here at the International Institute for Environment and Development. And as part of the Global Climate Law Policy and Governance Team, I support the least developed countries in implementing the transparency framework established under the United Nations Climate Change Convention. And I also support the least developed countries group in the UN climate negotiations on transparency related issues. I'm very delighted to welcome you all today to this uh, session where we'll be exploring and discussing what means the new Paris Agreement transparency framework for the least developed countries. We know that the Paris Agreement establishes a new reporting framework common to all countries and it's to track progress towards achieving uh, their global emission reduction commitments. This new transparency framework is also crucial to increase ambition and encourage the climate action needed to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. But on the other hand, it also brings new requirements and challenges, especially for the most vulnerable countries. So based on uh, the experience of implementing the current transparency arrangements, today's event aims at increasing understanding of the implications of this new framework for the least uh, developed countries. We will start today our discussion with an overview from the Climate Change Convention Secretariat of the new reporting, reporting requirements and the insights they have gained during the implementation of the current transparency arrangements, followed by the views of LDC's national experts from Malawi, Liberia and Sudan, who are working on their country's reporting processes. In order to avoid uh, potential connectivity problems that we know there are, and to ensure that we can all enjoy and learn from the national expert experiences, they have kindly recorded their presentation. So I would really like to thank you all, uh, all of them for having uh, done that extra effort to support this webinar. So having said that, uh, I would uh, like to introduce our first panelist, Chu Hong Wang. Thank you, Shu Hong, for being here with us today. And Shu Hong is the team lead of the International Consultation and Analysis Support Unit at the Transparency Division of the UNFCCC Secretariat. She was part of the core team of the Secretariat supporting the negotiations on the Enhanced Transparency Framework under the Paris Agreement and on the Katowice Rulebook on the ETF. Currently, her work is focused on supporting the implementation of transparency and monitoring reporting and verification arrangements by developing country parties, including capacity building activities in these countries. So over to you, Shuhan. Um, thank you, uh, Fernanda, for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. Um, so I'll sh first show my screen, share my screen. Um, so, um, dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. So, it's a great pleasure for me to attend this very important event. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank LDCs uh, for their great support and inputs to the UNFCCC process and to congratulate them for actively participating in the existing transparency framework under the convention. Uh, out of 47 LDCs, so far, seven have already submitted their first annual uh, report under the convention. So um, the first element I would like to cover today um, is to map the key difference between the existing and future transparency arrangements. So under the existing um, measurement reporting and verification, the so-called MRV uh, arrangements, developing countries uh, submit national communications every four years uh, and uh, their biannual update reports every two years. Um, and uh, these reports cover their climate action and support needed, uh, including GHG inventories. So the BURs, 
then we'll go through the international consultation and analysis process. Uh, we call this ICA process. And this is a two-step process. Uh, firstly, technical analysis of the BURs. Second step is the multilateral process. Uh, it's like a peer exchange workshop under the SBI. Um, so the current MRV package also includes Red Plus um, process. Those countries seeking to obtain and receive payments for their Red Plus uh, results-based actions will need to um, provide a report uh, as a technical annex under the uh, BUR, um, within the BURs. So looking at the uh, new enhanced transparency framework under the Paris Agreement, we can see that uh, uh, structurally they are similar uh, to the existing MRV uh, framework. It starts with reporting uh, with the submission of uh, BTR, BANU, new BANU transparency report. And then this report will be uh, reviewed by technical expert teams and then go through a multilateral uh, process to consider the progress. Um, however, the new enhanced transparency framework introduces enhanced reporting in terms of the scope uh, uh, and the level of details, uh, including uh, more um, higher, uh, more advanced methodologies um, in reporting the information. For instance, the tracking progress of NDCs is a new element. And then the use of uh, 2006 IPCC guidelines um, compared to uh, the use of 1996 IPCC guidelines. And these changes imply that countries will need more uh, robust institutional arrangements and, and a higher degree of capacities. It's important to note that countries can provide information on adaptation and loss and damage in the new annual transparency report. And this element is really key to um, this uh, to LDCs. So uh, looking at the timeline, uh, the first annual transparency report under the Paris Agreement will be submitted no later than the end of 2024. And then this will replace the current annual update reports under the Convention. Um, and recognizing that countries have different starting points and varying degree of capacities, uh, the ETF has built in flexibility to facilitate improved reporting over time. Due to their special circumstances, LDCs and Cs may submit BTR at their discretion. Um, so now the second element I would like to cover in this presentation is to uh, share with you the, the challenges faced by LDCs in implementing the existing transparency arrangements. There are two main challenges. The first one is the uh, lack of well-established and sus sustainable Arrange institutional arrangements for reporting. In many cases, um, preparation of these reports are project-based, um, very often prepared by consultants. And this could increase the workload to collect and analyze data each time uh, when reporting has to be done. The second key uh, challenge is the lack of clear understanding um, of different reporting requirements and their possible linkages. In this regard, uh, I'm happy to let you know that the Secretariat is making constant efforts to assist parties. For example, the LDC expert group with the support of the Secretariat is developing a training for LDCs on the Paris Agreement. The objective of the training is to support LDCs on how to efficiently and effectively navigate the many uh, reporting elements uh, of the uh, many elements of the Paris Agreement. We expect to roll this out from September and it will be an online um, course. Um, the third element I would like to cover today is the briefly talk about the benefits uh, of reporting of the reporting process. As you can see, there are many, many uh, benefits, but here I think I would like to just emphasize three. The first one is, to, is um, the reporting actually, uh, the data and information generated through the reporting process uh, could really facilitate policy making at the national level. Um, the second uh, key benefit is uh, various reports provide solid evidence for specific gaps and needs uh, of the parties, of the countries. Uh, which in turn informs more targeted support 
provided to, to these countries. For example, uh, the NAP is the main reference for accessing support, especially the funding from GCF. The third key element is this reporting process really is a trigger to help um, the establishment with the domestic system institutional arrangements. So in the longer term, it helps build the internal capacity of the countries um, to, to, to adapt to this constant reporting in the future. The last element, finally, uh, I would like to uh, mention um, that um, what LDCs can do actually during this transition period. So as mentioned earlier, the, the ICA process, international consultation uh, process for developing countries under the convention is the existing MRV. And uh, so far we have um, seven uh, LDCs already uh, submitted their reports. And then these reports will be analyzed by a team of uh, technical experts. And that process itself is a capacity building process for, for countries. So as the, the new ETF, uh, trans new enhanced transparency framework builds on the existing um, transparency arrangements under the convention, uh, we, we, we can see that the, the ICA process, so we, we really encourage all developing countries to participate in at least one round of the ICA process, just to, to gain experience before the ETF becomes operational in 2024. So the existing uh, MRB process provide uh, an essential learning opportunity for countries uh, in the following main aspects. It, first, it helps countries to better understand the reporting requirements and improve the, the clarity of information reported. Secondly, the technical experts will help countries to identify their capacity building needs and areas for improvement. And lastly, um, the, the existing process will facilitate mutual learning among parties by sharing best practices and, and build trust. Uh, so finally, if you're interested, you will find more information here in this new publication. It was recently published just last month, so it contains really the most um, updated information. Um, and then uh, I've also included relevant um, websites um, on the reporting and also on um, various reporting adaptation. So thank you. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Shuhan, for this uh, comprehensive presentation that set us the scene for the next presentations uh, on reporting experiences from the country's perspectives. So, and to all our audience, please feel free to share with us your questions for Shuhan in the Q&A box that is at the bottom of the screen. So now our next uh, speaker, our next speaker is Red, Rehad Ham, Ahmed Hassan. Uh, who is going to present the reporting experience of Sudan. Rehab is a coordinator for Sudan's third national communication and a member of the Higher Environment and uh, Natural Resources. As the rest of uh, the country specialist, Rehab has an extensive experience in the UNFCCC reporting process. Unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, Rehab could not join us uh, via the Zoom platform today but she will be answering your questions in written and we will be sharing her answers with you during the Q&A session. So to help us coordinate this, I do encourage you uh, to submit your questions to Rehab as soon as you can. So now we are going to listen to Rehab's presentation. Good morning to you all. Let me at the outset express my gratitude to the IIED for offering me this opportunity to share with you Sudan's experience in reporting under the UNFCCC and Paris Agreement. Uh, well, uh, Sudan participated in the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, which is also known as RIO-S Summit in 1992, and was among the first countries that signed the UNFCCC in 1992 and ratified it in 1994. Uh, Sudan had also signed Kyoto Protocol in 1997. Uh, we had also signed the newly adopted Paris uh, Agreement in 2016. Sudan is active member in the UNFCCC negotiation process and had members in different constituted bodies and committees under the UNFCCC, IPCC, and Paris Agreement, like the, the WIM, the LEG, the CGE and IPCCC Bureau 
as well. Uh, Sudan is very committed towards the compliance with the UNF C. In 1995, we received the fund from the Global Environmental Facility, the GEF, to start preparing our first national communication. And hence, the national communications is an uh, enabling activity. It was prepared in a highly participatory approach. So we intended to, to involve as much as expert we can in this process. So more than 300 national experts representing 50 related institutions had participated in the preparation of uh, the first and second national communication as well. Uh, first national communication was submitted in 2003 and the second national communication in 2013. Uh, we had started preparing our third national communication in 2016 and uh, the first biennial update report in 2019, the last year we started, and is expected to be submitted together to the UNED C Secretariat in 2021. Uh, after the government endorsement. Um, uh, okay. Uh, in terms of reporting under the UNFCCC, as I said in my previous slide, the first and second national communications were prepared and submitted in 2003 and 2013, respectively. Then we prepared our National Adaptation Program of Action, the NAPA, in 2007, and was followed by preparation of National uh, Adaptation Plan, the NAP, in 2013. We were also among the 31st countries who had prepared the technology needs assessment, the TNA, for both adaptation and mitigation, and it included also the technology action plan and project ideas as well. Uh, we submit the TNAs in 2013. Uh, the National Appropriate Mitigation Action, the NAMA, was also prepared and submitted in 2013. Uh, we had also uh, uh, prepared our intended national retirement contributions, the INDCs, in 2015. And currently, reporting of reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, the Red Plus activities, are also going on as one of the reporting under the, 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 the UNFCCC. So, uh, the national communications uh, reports are, are considered as, uh, if I may say, a multi-phases report. It's not only about the compliance to the UNFCCC, but also one of the most important tools for bringing the climate change concerns to the attention of policy makers at the national level. Uh, it also considered as a library for providing a wealth of information for scientists and researchers and for academic purposes as well, because uh, this is the only document that you can find information regarding the greenhouse gas in emissions from different sectors in the country. You can also find uh, the mitigation, uh, mitigation um, options and strategies for these, on how to reduce these emissions from different sectors. So it's a multi-purpose uh, document. Uh, of course, we encountered a lot of uh, gaps and challenges in, in preparing our first and second and also third national uh, communication. Uh, for example, the lack of some activity data, uh, especially needed to conduct the GHG inventory, accompanied with the difficulties in using of the 2006 IPCC software, and we found that it's uh, difficult to be used in our circumstances. Because for example, in the software, uh, one of the drop-down boxes, you will find that the highest temperature for the livestock is 28. While here in Sudan, sometimes the temperature might reach uh, 48. Yeah, so it's not, uh, it doesn't suit our national circumstances. And this is of course, is a challenge and currently we are thinking to develop our own 
uh, software that uh, uh, that uh, suit our national circumstances and data needs. Uh, we also suffering from discontinuity of the national team because after they get trained, they might quit, they might be moved to another institution. And this is, of course, uh, considered as crucial to our uh, national communication. Uh, sometimes also disputes might occur between the national climate change focal point and the national uh, communication coordinator because in most cases the UNF table C focal person is not the coordinator for the national communication and this, this might lead to some sort of uh, dispute if I may say. Regarding the lesson learned, I can summarize it in four main points. Uh, establishing national formal arrangement as appropriate may clarify uh, sectoral roles and enhance the coordination between the involved institutions and may also facilitate the regular data collection and review uh, or approval process for the data. Uh, choosing and manipulating an appropriate national greenhouse gas inventory coordinating body and of course the location within the government of the national GHG inventory coordinating body is a key factor influencing the effectiveness of institutional arrangement and in particular the strength of its mandate and ability to conduct interministerial coordination. Uh, the third point is the stakeholder involvement. Uh, engaging a broad range of stakeholders is very important for the process. It is important that clear roles, responsibilities, schedules, and outputs are defined early to ensure uh, multi-stakeholder process produce effective results and provide necessary inputs to compile the inventory and support other analysis in the report. And throughout our preparation of national communications, we had engaged many government institutions, non-governmental organizations, academic institutions, the sales center, and even the private sector uh, to access the expertise, facilitate data collection of relevant information, and build capacities and raise awareness of reporting activities beyond the government entities. As I said in my previous slide, uh, more than 50 different institutions were involved uh, in, the, in the preparation of national communication reports. And the last point is the in-country institutional and technical capacity building. And some developing countries, as uh, you're all aware, have often relied on consultants and external experts to assist them in preparing inventories. And this can hinder the institutional knowledge and capacity gains, of course. We had managed to develop our national capacity, which helps to avoid reliance on external expertise. Uh, improve uh, institutional, uh, thereby enhancing the country ownership of the process. Uh, regarding the, the commitment and the Paris Agreement, uh, to prepare ourselves for reporting under the Paris Agreement, we in Sudan are about to receive funds to prepare uh, for the capacity building initiative on transparency, the CBIT, which will aim to strengthen uh, our institutional and technical capacities to meet enhanced transparency requirements and that the Paris Agreement and improve it and improve it our um, over time. Uh, the CBIT project will be considered as an opportunity to provide relevant tools training and assistance for meeting the provisions of the Enhanced trans Transparency Permit of Article 13. Uh, the expected output of the CBIT process uh, will be developing an institutional arrangement for climate transparency, uh, achieving public awareness and capacity building of national experts, um, enhancing the greenhouse gas inventories and mitigation options, and development of robust domestic MRV and uh, monitoring and evaluation systems as well. 
and finally achieving progress on tracking the NDC implementation and transparency. And as you know, the NDC is um, the core theme of, uh, of Paris Agreement. And uh, by saying this, I have reached to the end of uh, my presentation, and I will remain for further questions and inquiries. And thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you so much, Reha, for uh, your solid presentation. And I would really like to remind you to send your questions to Reha, that she is online with us. Uh, and uh, she will be answering uh, your questions in written, so if you can send uh, them as soon as possible, so that could be perfect. And now, as we have a very tight agenda today, we are quickly moving to our next panelist, Charles Asomana from Ladivia. Charles is the National Project Coordinator of Ladivia's first biannual update report project. He is responsible for overseeing the project implementation including the provision of technical assistance to the national technical expert groups. And Charles is also a technical expert reviewer to the UNFCCC. It is a pleasure for me and my team from Liberia to participate in this webinar. And I would like to thank the organizer for giving us this opportunity. This presentation seeks to provide response to the theme question of this webinar. What does the Paris Agreement's transparency framework mean for Liberia as a least developed country? As seen in the online, I'll try to share our national reporting experience under the convention explain where we are at the moment in terms of our national communication and by annual update report, present our vulnerabilities as key motivations from our national perspective, as well as outline challenges, outcomes, and lessons learned. The act of the national legislature that created the EPA of Liberia, among other things, gave the agency the authority to sustainably manage the environment, including climate change. For example, preparing and submitting national communications and by annual update reports. Of course, to adequately execute its mandate, EPA works with government ministries and agencies as well as other infantry stakeholders. In this slide, the structure of climate change governance in Liberia is summarized in an organogram form. As seen, EPA works in consultation with the National Climate Change Steering Committee, which is the overarching institutional structure with the mandate to coordinate and supervise the implementation of climate change policy. The National Climate Change Secretariat, as seen here, is a supportive component of the steering committee. The Ministry of Finance and Development Planning, MOFDP, headed by a minister, chairs the EPA board. As stated, EPA is the designated national authority. So, if you want to conduct greenhouse gas inventory in Liberia, what institutions Will you be looking up for the major ones for the key mission sectors are highlighted in this table in red for the energy sector we have the ministry of mines and energy for the ippu the ministry of commerce waste city corporations agriculture the ministry of agriculture 
and for the forestry and other land use or the follow sector we have the forestry development authority for the forestry subsector and the liberia land authority for the land use subsector so let's address this question where are we with our infantry well liberia is in the advanced stages of the second national communication and first biannual of the report and hopefully by october this year will be submitted to the unf c as you can see here in paragraph two these are the gases covered for now perfluorocarbon pfcs and sulfur hexafluoride sf6 are not included the tier one approach of the 2006 ipcc guidelines is being used even though liberia's contribution to the global greenhouse gas emissions is negligibly low the impacts of climate change are even more evident in a country over the past few decades given that the um their physical the financial the human and the natural capitals are low to build resilience there are increased occurrences of flood across the country as you can see in this slide and the next this is a pictorial of the level of flood damage and coastal erosion especially in impoverished communities the preparation of our national communications and bound of the report has not come without enormous challenges infantry stakeholders are not forthcoming with data due to lack of trust on availability of data and in some cases variations in format perhaps due to lack of understanding of greenhouse gas infantry in addition from um, experience i can say that we have weak institutions to successfully execute sustainable infantry activities the absence of even an MOU and a huge rate of turnover of staff in public service are further hurting the infantry process. Lessons learned. We have now come to the realization that engagement and consultation with stakeholders, strong institutional and individual capacities as well as robust institutional arrangement are essential elements to help us successfully transition to the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Climate Agreement. In conclusion, let me hasten to say that Liberia is not fully prepared for the new framework that the Paris Agreement presents. But when capacities are enhanced at the systemic, institutional, and individual levels, Liberia will be in an ideal position to present its first biannual transparency report, or the BTR, in 2024, as required for all countries as per the transparency framework once again on behalf of my team i will want to thank the international institute for environment and development iied for considering us and personally thanks to all of you for listening we hope to learn from your national reporting experiences and gain further insight on the real meaning, the actual meaning 
of the transparency framework for least developed countries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. Thank you a lot for this uh, presentation, very clear presentation on Liberia's reporting experience and for sharing with us uh, Liberia's current needs to be better prepared to implement the new enhanced transparency framework. Again, uh, I will welcome all your questions to Charles or to the previous speakers in the Q&A box. Uh, and now I will introduce our last but very exciting speaker from Malawi, Yamikani Idris. Yamikani is an environmental officer responsible for environmental planning, monitoring, and research in the Ministry of Natural Resources, Energy, and Mining in Malawi. He is also a climate change negotiator and is currently co-coordinating the transparency thematic team within the LDC group. Yamikani is also a technical expert reviewer to the UNFCCC. Good morning, good afternoon, and um, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Yamikan uh, J.D. Idris from Malawi. I will present uh, Malawi's experience in reporting under the UNEF C. My presentation is going to take you through Malawi's status of reporting, motivation for reporting, challenges faced by Malawi in the current MRV system, uh, lessons learned, and uh, what Malawi has already done in preparation for the ETF. Malawi, as a party to the UNFCCC, is committed and um, is happy uh, to be meeting the reporting requirements under the Convention. As among non Annex 1 parties, Malawi is obliged to report the national communications and the biannual update reports, of course, with uh, some flexibilities. So far, Malawi uh, reported its initial national communication in 2003 and uh, reported the second national communication in 2011. And currently, Malawi is preparing its third national communication and uh, together uh, with its first biannual update uh, reports. These two are under finalization process. In its uh, initial national communication and second national communication, Malawi reported uh, its greenhouse gas uh, inventories. Uh, why are we motivated to report? Uh, first and foremost is that um, according to the UN4C national communication and BUR guidelines, uh, we are mandated uh, to report. So we report to meet the reporting requirements as a mandatory uh, under the national communication and BUR guidelines. Uh, but secondary, uh, which is also very important, uh, Malawi is implementing the national climate change management policy of 2016 and uh, the national development agenda, which is the Malawi growth and development strategy. Uh, we finalized uh, implementing the MTDS2 and now we are implementing the Malawi growth and development uh, strategy number three. So this national development agenda considered climate change management as among the key priority areas. So reporting is important so that we monitor climate change action at national level, which is in line with these two, and also showcasing our actions to the international community. At the same time, uh, we are able to demonstrate or show our green growth pathway uh, through uh, reporting. Despite being committed and registering our progress in reporting on climate change action, Malawi is still facing a lot of challenges. And these include insufficient financial resources and unsustainable funding for reporting, inefficient data management and storage system, limited human resources capacity in terms of numbers, skill range and depth, inadequate capacity to track uh, climate finances and our progress in implementation of um, our NDC, and uh, preparation in preparation of GSG national inventories, Malawi lacks in-country expertise, complete sets of data, and country-specific emission factors in most uh, sectors. So you see that uh, 
challenges like lack of uh, complete sets of data will make Malawi face problems when we want to voluntarily report uh, the projections as among uh, reporting items in the enhanced transparency uh, framework. Uh, lessons learned and what needs to be done under ITF. We have uh, learned that uh, to effectively implement the framework, uh, the following are very important. The first one is uh, strengthening institutional arrangements and uh, national capacity as a key to an effective reporting. This is witnessed uh, because this is evidenced uh, when we see a lot of countries or parties who are able to meet the reporting requirements, they have a strong and well-capacitated uh, uh, systems. And also we need to explore sustainable funding sources to deal with finance shortfalls and uh, the need for efficient collection of effective and reliable data. Uh, this will include having in uh, country specific emission factors and efficient uh, data collection methods and storage. We have also to integrate the MRV system into existing national reporting systems. External consultants are not sustainable, hence uh, the need to develop in-country expertise and also the need uh, for developing robust M&E frameworks with measurable indicators in, uh, for tracking progress in implementation of NDC. So Malawi took it as an opportunity uh, by responding the call to update the NDC. Our M NDC now has uh, measurable uh, indicators. Also, another important lesson is raising public awareness. So the public has to be aware of um, our uh, status of reporting and also uh, uh, what leader reporting means uh, under the convention so that we can enhance public uh, participation. What Malawi has done in preparation of the ETF, so far Malawi, uh, with support from USAID, uh, has issued a GHG inventory system, and also under the same uh, project, uh, commissioned development of some emission factors, i.e. in agriculture for the enteric fermentation, uh, developed the climate change management information system with support from UNDP, also established the National Climate Change Fund through an act of parliament, uh, developed the TNAs, uh, where technologies were prioritized in adaptation and mitigation, and also developed and submitted a project proposal for cb to jeff which has just been approved. So it is our hope and belief that uh, the support from cb will be used to operationalize these systems, uh, because uh, despite being uh, developed, they are not yet operational. And this includes the GHGIS, uh, the Information Region System, and the Fund. So the support from CBIT and, um, and other well-wishers uh, will help us operationalize these systems uh, so that now we are able to uh, report effectively. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you, Yanikani. Thank you a lot for your presentation. And now we welcome all your questions to Yamikani uh, through the, the Q&A box. And <clears throat> we are on time and we have some minutes to answer uh, some of your questions and have the, a discussion with the, the speakers. So I will uh, start with the first question for uh, Shu Hon. Shu Hon, uh, someone asked you how will the ETF uh, reporting happened uh, in 2024 when DLDC still received project-based support as per the current financial mechanism, especially the GCF, um, and that is also uh, still also a consultant-led. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, this is a very good question, a very challenging question as well. Uh, indeed, right now uh, for the G GEF, uh, Global Environment Facility, when they support uh, the preparation of uh, NC and, and BURs, um, uh, they are basically a project based. Uh, but then um, this, this money are considered as kind of seed money. So the aim really is to trigger 
uh, a process at the national level um, to, to really to start, establish, put, a, put in place institutional arrangements um, at the national level. Um, but then um, the good thing with GEF, right now GEF is considering its funding policy for, um, uh, for the supporting of the new annual transparency report under the Paris Agreement and how to uh, make the transition between the current funding and, and the future. Um, and uh, so there are many considerations in, in, in shaping this funding policy. One being um, the these projects should aim to, to help parties facilitate the establishment of uh, sustainable uh, domestic MRV and institutional arrangements. Um, so I hope that provides some clarity. Um, so thank you again for the good question. Back to you, um, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you, Zhu Hong. Uh, now we are uh, moving to Charles. Uh, we would like to ask you what Liberia stands to, to benefit after the BUR, uh, the first BUR is reported la later this year. Thank you so much for that question. Liberia is a party of the UNFCCC, and as a party. There are reporting requirements that we must fulfill. One of such is uh, the biannual update report to be submitted once every two years. So once it's submitted, it means that we have fulfilled our reporting requirement. We have enhanced our national reporting performance. And that means a lot, for example, in climate change negotiation dynamics, in my opinion, is, is money for action. So a proposal in a position where we, we can make a strong case, you know, to, to enhance our ability both in locally and internationally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for your answer. And now we have a, um, a question for uh, Yami Kani. Um, uh, there a question, the chair a question like if you can answer. It's what kind of domestic legislation is helpful is helpful to strengthen national reporting arrangements. So over to you, Yamikan. Yeah, thank you, Fernanda, and our uh, viewers over the world. Um, the question which I'm, I would like to answer is that uh, what kind of domestic legislation uh, is helpful to strengthen national uh, reporting arrangement. I think um, on this one, uh, we rely most on the MOUs. So we didn't need to uh, strengthen uh, these MOUs through developing domestic registration. Uh, for instance, um, uh, for us to strengthen uh, the national reporting arrangement in terms of finance, we have uh, taken the approach of creating the uh, National Climate Change Fund. So this has been gazetted through an act of parliament so that all the funds are going to be going into one basket. So I think we need to sit down and think of how we can uh, now uh, domesticate uh, these other uh, reporting requirements so that we can now produce the registration uh, to enhance the MOUs, uh, which are quite the uh, most used currently. Thank you so much for your answer. And now we have another question for uh, Shuhan. And um, this, uh, the question is related to the technical, as the technical assistance and finance. And it says that it seems that most support is through technical assistance. So if there is long-term long finance available for continued production of the ETFs and the national communications, so I think that for the biannual transparency reports and the national communications. Uh, thank you for, for the question. Actually, right now, uh, as you as you know, as you may know, under the Paris Agreement, there is this uh, funding, uh, this uh, mechanism in place, which is called Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, um, and then it supports uh, a, a number of projects um, to support parties uh, with their transparency uh, fulfillment of transparency um, reporting under transparency. Um, so th this this is really 
this is established under the Paris Agreement. So in the long run, this will be a dedicated uh, uh, a mechanism to support this activity. Um, and uh, another um, uh, reflections I would like to share is that um, right now um, there are various um, supports uh, being provided by various organizations and technical institutions. Um, there seems to be a need for, um, for, for, for these organizations to work together to, um, you know, to, to, avoid, to avoid duplication and try to build more synergy in terms of providing support um, to developing country parties. So this is another um, uh, reflection that I would like to share um, using this opportunity. Um, thank you. Back to you, Fernanda. Thank you, Suhan. We have other questions also related to, to the support effort least developed countries that I think that uh, I understand that can be, uh, have been answered uh, with your uh, answer. And, um, and now we have some, um, some uh, questions uh, from uh, Rehab and we are going to try to put out some answers on uh, now online. And um, we, uh, Matt is going to help us just to uh, uh, receive the answer from Rehab. And the question was, uh, the question that were made was to avoid discontinuity, what are the plans to maintain the national team? So the national team, the, the group of experts at national level, um, to, to continue the reporting process in Sudan. So uh, for Lewis, he was asking uh, how can we maintain the continuity of our national team? Uh, actually, this is uh, a little bit difficult in my country because as I, as I said before, um, the displacement of people or sometimes they have re uh, been moved to another institutions. But what we did, we managed to create uh, uh, greenhouse gas inventory units in 10 relevant institutions through a memorandum of understanding. And we, pre we, um, we provide them with computers and printers uh, because we want them to save the data, the activity data for the greenhouse gas inventory in this desktop. Uh, and then we, we connected all these units through a server. I don't know what, 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 what you, you name it. We call it server, yes, through iCloud. Uh, now all the data are kept in a safe place, in a safe computer. Even this person have been moved or uh, yeah, uh, went for another institution, the data is still kept in this. Uh, computer and we save it in the iCloud and we, we, we never we want to retrieve this data is available even if the person who was responsible of this work has did have been changed. The other people who will come and sit here, uh, all the data are still kept. And this is actually was very, very, very uh, efficient. Yes, because we cannot guarantee that the, 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 the team members are not moved. But now we ensure that the data is kept and can be shared at any time. And for myself as the national coordinator, whenever I want to retrieve the data, to, to update the data for the GHG inventory, I can open it from my desktop and through this server, um, yeah, I can change, I can do whatever needed. Thank you, Matt. That worked very well, and we uh, we were able to have rehab with us today. That's really good. And we have another question for Shuhon, also on uh, uh, on funding, and uh, we're asking if there's funding for developing local communities' competence, because the top down uh, the top down approach and to consider local context. So, how can that be possible at all? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the good question. Um, this is a very important question. Actually, there are a number, very various elements in various activities are having this uh, component building uh, local community capacity. However, there is a need to further systemize this efforts. 
um, for the specific um, uh, ski, uh, projects or schemes in place, I'll need to um, consult with my colleagues uh, in the Secretariat and I, I may be able to provide more uh, specific information on that through uh, IIED uh, after this webinar. Thank you, thank you, Xu Hon. Now we are going to go to a couple of questions also to Maid Reha. Um, one is related to what institutional existing arrangements, law policies, etc. did you use to allow for this reporting? And is it related to the national communications or communications and in some national law other than the mitigation, the national mitigation reports and the um, national mitigation report? For the implementation of Paris Agreement and the NDCs, we will also follow the same pattern uh, that have been uh, used for the national communication because it approved that it is uh, very fine and we work uh, through this pattern since our first national communication. Uh, as I said in my presentation, almost more than 300 persons or members were participated in this uh, national communication, so we will follow the same participatory approach for implementation of uh, of other reporting requirements under Paris Agreement, like the Biennial Transparency Report, and for implementation of indices, which usually rely on our teams rather than relying on one consultant. Uh, even those people sometimes uh, um, uh, participate in regional training that uh, conducted by the CGE or by the UNFCCC Secretariat or by the Global Support Program or UNIP uh, Africa. Uh, we sent members from our teams to participate in this regional training. Uh, regarding the review, we mostly rely on um, our national expert from from the universities and research center that have a good experience in climate change issues. And also we rely very much in what is called the Global Support Program, which is a body, uh, um, a joint body between UNIP and UNDP. And they provide technical assistance and support for, the, uh, for uh, African countries, for non, actual non-annex one countries, developing countries, not, not only Africa. Uh, for provision for the review process. Now, currently, we will send them our uh, greenhouse gas inventory and our national communication as a whole when done and finished for the process of review. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Reha, for that uh, good answer. And I realize that we are running out of time and we we didn't have to answer all the questions that you have submitted in our panel in our panel so but we are um, our panelists are available to answer your questions uh, offline so i would try to make the best effort just to answer all your questions and, and so you can have uh, your your answers also if not uh, leave and um, so we are now coming to an end of the of the webinar and uh, and i before closing uh, i would like to ask all the participants to give uh, the feedback by filling a short survey that we prepared and uh, that we are we are going to post also in the chat. So if you can give us uh, your feedback, that would be very useful for us to, to improve in our next webinars. And also I would really like to thank you all for joining us today. And, uh, and also uh, I would like to invite you to join us for our next webinars in this series that is featuring LDC's national experiences in implementing the Paris Agreement in their national frameworks and policies. And our next webinar will take place next week on Thursday, the 13th of August, and we'll focus on the experiences of LDC's currently in the process of developing their long-term strategies. And the third webinar is hosted by IIED in partnership with the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAT, and it will take place on Tuesday, 8th of September, and we'll examine LDC's experiences of loss and damage. And uh, there was a question on loss and damage that we couldn't answer today, so it could be uh, maybe answered during that webinar. So two really exciting webinars for our uh, next um, sessions. 
And you can find more information and registration details in our website and the social media and through the link that also we are now posting in the chat box. And I would like to give a final huge thanks to all our great panelists and uh, also to all of you for joining us today and for sharing your valuable time with us. And um, also we hope that we can see you again in our upcoming events. And please do reach out to us if you have any further comments or questions uh, we, as we would really like to keep this transparency conversation uh, going. So I hope you have a, a great day and this is all for my side. Uh, goodbye to all. <laughs>